Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. I'm Alita, and on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. Epic has sued Apple and Google in two separate but similar lawsuits alleging antitrust violations, and we got a number of requests to talk about it. So that's exactly what we're gonna do today, coming right up on Legal Bites. Okay, so before we get into any amount of detail, let me just make a few important points. First, there are people who love to hate all three companies involved in this lawsuit, and people sometimes get very emotional about it. Because of that, it can be hard to remain unbiased when we get into controversies like these. However, our goal with this topic, like with all the topics we cover, is to try to remain as objective as possible, because we're here to try to educate and inform. The purpose of this video and all the videos that we'll do on this subject is to break it down into manageable pieces so you can independently come to your own conclusion. Second, we're about to get into an area of law that's both complex and highly nuanced. Cases like these try to find the line between businesses that are just really good at doing business and businesses that are somehow abusing their position to improperly insulate themselves from competition. That is a line that is much harder to find than some might have you believe. If someone is telling you that they know absolutely who will win with complete certainty, they're either lying to you or they really don't know enough about this area of law. Which leads me to my third point. If you're looking for a black and white conclusion as to who will win these two lawsuits, this video will not be able to give it to you because no one can really do that at this point. However, if you're looking to understand what's going on and to learn how to analyze it to form an educated opinion, then you've come to the right place. So to make this beast of a topic approachable and understandable, we made the decision to break this up into several videos and we'll turn it into a series. Given the fact that so much has already happened in this case, there's a lot to cover. So we'll try to get to everything as quickly as we can. Normally we put up videos about once a week, but we'll try to get the next videos out sooner if we can, because we know that there's quite a bit of interest out there on the topic. In the meantime, I know Richard Hogue over at Hogue Law has already done a whole series with his take on the topic, where he's gone through each development at pretty much lightning speed. He does a great job going through all the filings claim by claim, and he gives a great analysis. So if you haven't already, you should definitely check him out. For our part, we're gonna take a slightly different approach because we're gonna start by going a little more slowly to explain the big picture of antitrust law so you can have a good framework for understanding the arguments on each side. I also might end up coming to a few different conclusions than Richard does in his analysis, which is normal and reasonable minds can totally differ on these matters. For me, at least at this point, I think Apple and Google both have a lot to be concerned about. And while I'm still working through case law to parse through specifics and my conclusion can change based on more research or as the case develops, I'm kind of thinking we might end up seeing a material change in the way we see and interact with app stores on our phones and tablets. I'll get into why I think that way later when I get into some of the more specifics of the lawsuits. So to give a basic structure to the series, in this video, we'll give background to talk about what happened leading up to the lawsuit. Then we'll talk about the general claims Epic makes as well as the basics of antitrust law and some of the things that Epic will need to show in order to win. In the videos following this one, we'll go over some of the specifics in each complaint as well as the temporary restraining order that Epic filed against Apple earlier this week. If you don't know what a temporary restraining order is, don't worry, we'll talk about it in due course. Each of those filings deserves its own treatment, so that's really what we're gonna do here. And finally, in each video, including this one, we'll give the sections and timestamps in the description below in case you wanna skip ahead. Okay, let's get into the meat and potatoes. So this whole saga really started a couple years ago back with Epic Games Inc., which is an American video game and software developer and publisher based in Cary, North Carolina. Epic is most famous for its online battle royale type game, Fortnite. Fortnite is played on a number of devices, including PCs through platforms like Steam, which is owned by the company Valve, 
as well as consoles like the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and the Nintendo Switch. Finally, you can also play it on a mobile device like a smartphone or a tablet. Prior to the lawsuits against Apple and Google, Epic got into controversy by severely undercutting the competitiveness of Valve's video game distribution service, Steam. The controversy stemmed from the fact that in order to distribute games on Steam, PC game developers have to pay Valve a 30% cut from the games they sell on the platform. In December 2018, Epic opened up its own Epic Games Store in direct competition with Steam and Epic quickly started offering PC publishers a severe reduction from the rate charged by Valve. Whereas they'd have to pay Valve 30% to distribute their games on Steam, if they distributed instead on the Epic Games Store, Epic would take just 12%, which is less than half of what Valve was charging. At the same time, in a supposed effort to compete with dominant storefronts, Epic sought exclusivity deals with game publishers. Epic's co-founder and CEO, Tim Sweeney, was very vocal in defending Epic's strategy, largely on Twitter. He said that he believed the 30% cut Valve was taking was bad for the gaming industry at large. He further explained that the resulting 18% increase in developer and publisher revenue is generally split between reinvestment, profit, and price reduction. And that the more these games are competing with one another, the more likely the proceeds go to reinvestment and price reduction. And as for the exclusivity strategy, he argued that it was Epic's belief that exclusives were the only strategy that would change the 30% status quo at a large enough scale to permanently affect the whole game industry. One thing that's interesting to note, and that's potentially important for the current lawsuits, is that IGN reached out to various sources across the gaming industry to get the actual numbers on what cuts most retailers take. What they found is that Valve's 30% cut through Steam was actually the industry standard across PC stores, console stores, mobile stores, and physical stores like GameStop, Amazon, Best Buy, and Walmart, and with only a few limited exceptions. Regardless, this series of moves by the Epic Game Store sparked fierce debate among players and developers alike, and that debate, it seems, is far from over. Now I want to fast forward to last week, but let me set up the foundation first. As I mentioned earlier, Epic's game Fortnite is also available on mobile devices. To play it on mobile, a player downloads the app through his or her phone's app store. While some games need to be purchased in order to download them, Fortnite is actually free to play. The way that Epic makes money from them is through in-app purchases, or IAPs, which are also known as microtransactions. In Fortnite, you can buy currency known as V-Bucks, which are used to customize the player's avatar in its weaponry and in its appearance, also known as skins. There are two important things to note in connection with the mobile version. First, mobile devices are essentially powered by an operating system or an OS. If you compare it to human biology, you can kind of think of it as like the phone is like your body and the OS is like your consciousness, if that makes sense. Now in the United States, the overwhelming majority of mobile devices run on one of two OSs, Android or iOS. Android is owned by Google and iOS is owned by Apple. While Google and Apple also both have a number of apps that come with the phone's operating system, the vast majority of apps out there are developed by third parties. Although there are some potentially important differences between the ways Apple and Google go about it, both Apple and Google require that apps be bought and sold through their respective app stores. When a developer offers an app to be placed on one of these app stores, they agree to Google's or Apple's terms of service. Another thing that happens when the app is offered up is that Google and Apple review the app to make sure that all of the app's features conform with their terms of service. When the app is approved and put up on the app store, and each time that app is actually sold, Apple or Google, whoever's hosting the app store, takes a 30% cut of the sale. So that's the same cut that Valve takes from developers on Steam. The second thing to note is that when a user has downloaded an app through the app store, if the app includes in-app purchases or IAPs, Apple and Google also require that the in-app purchases be made through the app store, where they also make a 30% cut. So for example, in Fortnite, when someone purchases skins or weaponry in the app, 30% of what you pay actually goes to Apple or Google. So we can finally talk about what happened last week. As you know, developers are always updating the apps we use and for all kinds of reasons, but typically to keep those apps running smoothly or even to improve them. 
Apple and Google obviously allow this, uh, so long as the updates don't violate their terms of service. Around a week ago, Epic released an update to the Fortnite app, which included a way for players to purchase V-Bucks in a way that expressly bypassed the Apple and Google app stores. The way it appeared to users was that they were given two options side by side. They could either buy 1,000 V-Bucks through the app store for $9.99, or they could buy the same number of V-Bucks directly from Epic for $7.99. It's clear what any player is going to do in that kind of scenario. Go for the cheaper option, obviously. The thing is, this was a deliberate violation of both Google's and Apple's terms of service. I mean, it says right there that the discount comes from bypassing the App Store, and Epic definitely knew that they weren't allowed to do that. By giving the option to bypass the App Store, Epic was essentially thumbing its nose at Google and Apple saying, we're not going to give you the 30% cut that we agreed to, in fact, we're not going to give you anything, and instead we'll give players a 20% discount. Of course, that also means that Epic is taking a 10% windfall with that move, which I'll get into in more detail later since there are multiple possibilities as to why they may have given a 20% reduction instead of a 30% reduction. There's a jaded reason, a strategic reason, and I guess a roundabout kind of consumer friendly reason later. But either way, Epic said, screw you, we're bypassing you. So Apple and Epic each responded within hours by removing Fortnite from their respective app stores. That same day, Epic filed two separate lawsuits in federal court, specifically in the Northern District of California. And not only that, Epic launched a massive, obviously well-prepared and orchestrated ad campaign for the lawsuit. The campaign includes the hashtag free Fortnite, as well as a video satirizing the 1984 TV advertisement that Apple used to introduce itself to the market. To see the whole thing unfold in real time as a lawyer, and I don't know, probably for anyone else too, was downright stunning. Honestly, the Academy Award for the most dramatic lawsuit of 2020 already goes to Epic, and this suit has only just begun. But about the ad campaign, I will say that personally, I'm by default incredibly suspicious of any person or company that resorts to dramatics in connection with any lawsuit or negotiation. Typically, I've found that when I'm in negotiations or I'm meeting and conferring with opposing counsel, and they start getting really loud and dramatic, it's usually more of a technique to try to distract you from the fact that the facts on their side kind of suck. I'm also naturally suspicious of any company that sets itself up to look like some dramatic white knight that's seeking nothing other than righteous justice for the people, as if they're not doing it because it somehow impacts their bottom line. No, of course, they're doing it for the whole world. Let's be real. Companies can be altruistic, empathetic, and do-gooders, but that's usually only when that all aligns with their profit-making goals. There's absolutely nothing wrong with a company seeking profit. It does all kinds of things for society, but just, I don't know, be real about the image you present when you do it, I guess. So I personally cringed when I saw the Fortnite 1984 ad, and I'm not a big fan of the free Fortnite hashtag. That one might also be because to me, a free anything hashtag seems like it should be reserved for people who are somehow oppressed. It kind of just rubs me the wrong way, but that could also be unique to me. I don't know, if you feel the same way, let us know in the comments below. Now, with that said, as much as I'm a little perturbed by the whole ad campaign, I think Epic might actually win this thing based on some of the case law that I've been reading, which you'll understand more of as we continue to unpack it. Okay, on to the actual lawsuit. So when someone files a lawsuit, they start by filing a pleading called a complaint. The complaint needs to allege enough facts and law to give the defendant enough notice of the claims to be able to put on a defense. In this case, Epic filed a 62-page complaint against Apple and a 63-page complaint against Google. That is a long complaint. In comparison, I think the longest complaint I've ever filed is maybe like 12, 14 pages, but they usually run around like seven or eight. The length isn't necessarily associated with how good or bad the case is, but if you're in the habit of drafting your pleadings to be as clear and concise as possible, it probably speaks more to the complexity of the issues more than anything else. To give a basic idea of what the lawsuits allege, in both complaints, Epic essentially alleges that both Apple and Google are monopolies within particular markets, and that both of them are engaging in improper, anti-competitive behavior to keep those monopolies and to unlawfully restrain trade. To sum it up a little, because I know that there are a lot of moving pieces here, this is basically a situation that started out in contract law under Apple's and Google's terms of service. Both Apple and Google essentially said, 
no, you can't do this thing by bypassing our rules. This is a contract which you agreed to, and you can't just decide not to abide by it. Under normal circumstances, this would probably be a winning argument. The difference here, however, is that instead of arguing that Epic didn't violate the agreement, Epic is instead essentially pointing to a crucial rule in contract law that says you can't enforce a contract that is illegal. And they're saying that this contract, the terms of service they just violated, is actually illegal because the terms of service violate antitrust law in various ways. So it's like Google and Apple are in a beach house saying, look, at this beautiful solid house you can't come through these solid walls you can't come through the door because it's closed and the same with the windows and what epic just did is they basically came in and pointed at the stilts that are holding up the house above the waves and claimed that they have a serious case of wood rot if the stilts are bad the house can come tumbling down epic ties this to two main claims first Epic says that both Apple and Google are improperly forcing all apps on their operating systems to go through their respective app stores, and in so doing, they improperly prevent competitors from entering the market. And second, Epic says that both Apple and Google improperly use their app stores as further anti-competitive gatekeepers by forcing all apps on their operating systems to funnel in-app purchases through their app stores. Now, you may have noticed that I just used the word improperly several times in a row now. That's because each of these allegations Epic made are activities that might be okay under the law, so long as circumstances around those activities don't make them improper. This area of law is incredibly nuanced, so I'll pull the scope back to talk generally about antitrust law before I eventually narrow the scope again as we go along. In the United States, antitrust law is a collection of federal and state laws that regulate businesses to promote competition on behalf of consumers. Historically, this area of law originally developed in the late 1800s as a response to the rise of the first titan corporations in America that developed around products like steel, copper, oil, iron, railroads, coal, and more. As some of these corporations grew, so did fears that they would soon overpower consumers if the government didn't step in to keep those corporations in check. Many, in fact, feared that the so-called robber barons of the day already were exploiting the masses. So in response, Congress made a rare move and actually did something about it. In a span of about 25 years, they enacted three main statutes. The Sherman Act of 1890, the Clayton Act of 1914, and the Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914. Since these laws were enacted, many states also enacted their own antitrust laws to supplement these laws. For example, in California, you have the California Cartwright Act and the California Unfair Competition Law. While these laws add on to the federal laws in various ways, the real heart of the antitrust laws is found in the federal laws. Because the federal lawsuits here allege mostly actions under the Sherman Act, I'll focus on that one. The Sherman Act basically outlaws contracts, combinations, or conspiracies that unreasonably restrain trade, and it also outlaws monopolizations, attempted monopolizations, and conspiracy or combination to monopolize. Claims under the Sherman Act can be brought by competing companies like Epic, or they can also be brought by the Department of Justice or by the Federal Trade Commission. However, no matter who brings the lawsuit, the purpose of this law is not to protect competing businesses, but to protect consumers. That means that ultimately, both sides need to try to show that their side of the lawsuit is better for consumers somehow. Section one of the Sherman Act is what makes it illegal to unreasonably restrain trade through contract combination or conspiracy. Although the word unreasonably doesn't appear in the statute, in practice, it's basically been inserted by the Supreme Court through statutory interpretation and case law. Usually in cases like this, we're looking at a company that somehow arranges for an exclusive deal, like through a contract. Companies that set up an exclusive dealing arrangement violate section one only if its effect is to foreclose competition in a substantial share of a particular market. In other words, where one company has an arrangement that restrains trade, if a competitor can get around that restraint simply by offering a better product or a better deal to acquire the consumer's business, then the restraint of that trade isn't enough to be a violation of the Sherman Act. What that means for this lawsuit is that Epic will need to show that not only do Google and Apple have arrangements that exclude competition, but they do so in a way that makes it basically impossible for a competitor to get around that arrangement. Next, section two of the Sherman Act is what makes it illegal to monopolize or to attempt to monopolize a particular market. To succeed in that claim, a plaintiff has to show one, that the defendant has monopoly power in the relevant market, and two, 
that the defendant either has achieved or is maintaining that monopoly power through means other than through growth or development as a result of a superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. So keep in mind here that the line between what's considered good business acumen and what's otherwise considered straight up anti-competitive behavior can be difficult to draw. And it's totally possible to have a company that has a great product and that makes a lot of smart business decisions that nonetheless is doing one thing that constitutes monopolization and therefore violates the Sherman Act. So in this case, Apple and Google can have great products and be found by the court to be engaging in monopolization. But equally important is that it's not enough to just show that the defendant has monopoly power in a given market. A company can have a complete monopoly in a particular market simply by virtue of being the only company to enter that market. For example, if and when SpaceX eventually lands on Mars and sets up the first human colony there, they wouldn't be in violation of the Sherman Act just by virtue of being the first to get to Mars. To do so, they'd have to do something that has an effect of essentially artificially preventing others from joining the market. So in this case, Epic will have to show in each individual case that one, Google and Apple each hold monopoly powers in their respective markets, and two, their monopoly powers rely on the exclusivity of these app stores for both downloading apps and through making these in-app purchases. Okay, so now we can get into what we can expect to happen next. So as you can see, both sections one and two of the Sherman Act put certain business activities in the context of a particular market, which the courts will call the relevant market. How the borders of that market get defined really impacts the rest of the case. So I think battle number one in both lawsuits will probably be defining the boundaries of the market. Epic will want the market in the Apple case to constitute just iPhones and iPads. In the Google lawsuit, Epic will want the market to consist of just Android phones and tablets. Apple and Google, on the other hand, will want the relevant markets to include at a minimum all smartphones and tablets, and maybe even PCs, consoles, maybe all devices where you can find Fortnite's 350 million users. That's because when you widen the scope, Apple and Google start to look much smaller and less like monopolies. In an upcoming video, I'll talk about some case law where courts have drawn that boundary in ways that might actually be similar to these cases. Next, Apple and Google will wanna show that there are ways for competitors to get around their app stores and in-app purchasing setups. Epic, on the other hand, will want to paint a picture showing that competitors are completely foreclosed from either entering the market or otherwise competing with Google and Apple. Looking ahead, Apple and Google each have 21 days to file a responsive pleading, and it'll be really interesting to see how they both respond. But in the immediate future, earlier this week, Epic also filed a temporary restraining order against Apple. We're definitely gonna do a whole video on that as soon as we can, but basically Epic is trying to get Apple to return Fortnite with the update back to the Apple App Store. Apple may respond faster than we can get a video out on this subject, but we'll cover it nonetheless. So what do you guys think? Are you more on the side of Epic here or maybe on the side of Apple and Google? Are you waiting to hear more to see where the chips fall? I really hope that this video was helpful to at least understand the framework for this whole controversy. And if you're mad that we didn't get into more specifics of each case, don't worry, we plan to go into depth in more videos here. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. It really does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new to our channel and you wanna see more, go ahead and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is coming. Until the next video, thanks. <laughs>